just we're pushing, you know, so looks like we are oh, live. Looks like we're live. Hi, Christy. Hi, <laughs> hi everybody on Facebook. <laughs> I'm really, really pleased to have this conversation today. Um, I'm Gina Carvalho from the Santa Barbara Response Network. And um, SBRN, as we are known, is a volunteer grassroots organization that does psychological first aid response to traumatic incidents in the community. Um, you can call us 24-7 in English and Spanish. Um, we've put our website and phone number on Facebook, so please feel free to reach out if there's ever a need and we can connect you with mental health services. And I'm really pleased to have my friend and colleague Christy Stillwell here today because the work that she's doing um, on raising awareness about teen violence in dating is like, I think one of the most pivotal things that we're experiencing right now with COVID, but even pre-COVID, you know. Um, and um, Christy, so the, you're with, it's, it's what is love teens.org, right? Yes. Yes. That's how that to get a hold of us. Yeah. And this is teen dating violence awareness month. So we wanted to have this conversation and um, I wanted, if I could take a minute to just introduce you and your a little bit about you and what you've done and it seems like for about 20 years that you've been working to try to raise awareness and um, a consciousness about what a healthy relationship is, particularly with our youth, who, as you said eloquently, don't get any information. And we all know that we, about what is, what is love and what's abusive and what's caring. And so that's been the mainstream of your work. And I know you've developed um, a curriculum that we'll go, go into during this conversation to um, teach youth and I think adults too, parents and educators about what love looks like. And um, you're the executive director and founder of what is love teens and I know you um, are working very hard to get curriculums and education in schools across the and that this is really your path today to talk with us and you've also been someone who supported this the Santa Barbara Response Network and our trained volunteer to help as well and have in the schools with us many times and thank you for that. Um, so, um, I wanted to start by um, just kind of putting a perspective for people that aren't aware of the actual, the magnitude of this issue we're talking about. And I was looking at some of the percentages of reported abusive relationships. And can you just say a little bit, um, please feel free to say anything to start off and, yeah. and then just how you well, see this um, in our Gina, I just want to thank you for um, creating an opportunity to have a conversation and to lean into a conversation around teen dating abuse, because I want to acknowledge that it's not an easy topic. And it's something that I think as adult people, it's hard for us to understand that this is happening um, at such startling high amounts to our young people. And so, you know, so we do know quite a bit about the magnitude. We do know, and there's this, uh, there was this very big research project that just ended in 2015 called STRIVE. And it was one of the biggest national research projects to date around this topic. And what, what we have known before this, this STRIVE research project was that one in three of our young people, our dating young people, are experiencing, one in three is what we thought before 2015, which is still a lot, 33% of our young people experiencing one form of dating abuse. Okay, so that means physical, emotional, 
digital or sexual abuse by somebody that they 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 love or they think they're in love with. Um, when this research team finished the project, um, what they discovered was that it was a much higher percentage. So it was closer to 60% of our young people who are dating are in relationships that are unhealthy, abusive, and 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 dangerous. And about the same amount, and this wow. is the part that's a little bit harder for us to understand, is that about the same amount, 58%, of these young people reported that they were actually doing some of these abusive things too. So what makes it a little bit different than adult um, intimate partner violence is that with the teen brain, they're taking turns being really ugly to each other. Now that doesn't mean uh, that girls are not more susceptible to physical violence and sexual violence. So when uh, the violence escalates uh, to physical, um, girls are getting more like hurt in more extreme ways and they're dying at much higher rates. So every four hours in the United States, a woman or girl is, is killed by somebody that they, that they have loved. Um, and, and to me, that is like such a, it's startling. And, you know, I call it the, the least talked about and, and least funded public health crisis. Because we know that this type of abuse um, lands on a young person in lots of different lots of different ways, and I think one of the things that you and I have spent quite a bit of time talking about and being curious about is that we know that young people that are either experiencing unhealthy abusive dating or participating in it have much higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicidality, or commit suicide. Um, up, I think there's this one research uh, that suggests that young people are five times more likely to think about or commit suicide who are in an unhealthy relationship. Um, so this is where our work intersects with each other is that we know that there's mental health impacts to a young person that's experiencing this. We know that there's a physical, you know, impact right to this. And then we also know there's an academic impact to this where these our young people are um, really struggling academically who are experiencing in, in something unhealthy. But what makes this so difficult, Gina, and I, this is what makes my work challenging is that we have this, this new generation of young people that are dating and the dating, they don't even call it that anymore, first of all. <laughs> you know, it's more of like, we're hanging out, we're a thing. Um, they hang out in groups, they don't go just hang out one on one. Um, so what makes it difficult is that it's it's just a very, very different landscape and the language is very, very different for this generation. And so a lot of times if they're in something, there's 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 behaviors that are that seem like, well, this just person just really likes me a lot. They're super jealous and they're texting me 100 times a day and wanting to know where I'm at and who I'm with and what I'm wearing. They, they mistake this for love. So a lot of the times what makes my work difficult is that this generation has a really, really difficult time identifying the unhealthy. And then what happens is that unhealthy gets bigger and bigger and bigger and, and more dangerous. Um, and so, you know, our work is about prevention. It's about, it's about education, really helping them to start these conversations and to be curious and then getting them connected to resources before it gets dangerous. So that's, I mean, that's a big chunk of what we're, you know, what we're trying to do. That's such important work. And I, I know you brought in the, the issues of depression and suicide and, and having worked all these years, not just with SBRN, but with Glendon. The Glendon Association is that you're absolutely right on that when we get a lot of these calls or or there's these issues of, of attempted suicide or suicide fear for suicide they're often tracked back to relationship yes there's always a rejection a confusion of, and and with as you said the youth brain that seems like it's going to be forever i mean right. I, no one's going to love me. right um, this is permanent I, I'm, I'm unlovable i'm and so what you're doing is so important because without that understanding about what healthy versus abusive is and that education, they're left hanging with, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? You know, nobody's going to love me. So 
is such important work and you're dealing with such an erratic part you know time in in, in our lives and so on on the other side of the abusive you know and and the relationship that is unhealthy what how would you describe and i know it's all on your website but how would you describe a healthy relationship for us adults and for teens <laughs> Well, and it's, I love that you asked that question and it's, it's a hard question for youth to, to answer. So when I say to a young person, okay, well, what, what's healthy? Like, tell me what's healthy. They kind of get this blank stare. Now I know that given the time and space to really kind of deconstruct it with something, but this is, this is an equal and par important part of our work. It's really important to be able to identify the hard to identify ways that this type of abuse starts right? Because it's sneaky, right? So it might be that somebody is calling you all the time, or they want you to stop hanging out so much with that one particular friend, because they just don't think they're a good influence on you. So you see what I mean? It's sneaky. So they're slowly over time isolating. But now flip it. What's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is somebody who trusts you and wants you to have good friends and wants you to spend time with your family and also wants to have time with you together with friends and family and maybe, you know, just one on one. So so one of the healthy examples would be having somebody in your life that has um, this ability to have you to share you with others. Right. That trusts you that listens to you that 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 kind of like builds you up and doesn't tear you down um, somebody that is going to um, be loyal to you right somebody that's going to have good communication somebody who's going to know how to be a good listener right these are all of those qualities somebody who's kind so really breaking down, you know, and I know we use words like kindness and respect and communication. What we need to be able to do, though, is to break down those words even a little bit further to say, OK, that's what that means to me. And this is how I know when I'm feeling respected. And so that's a big part of the work is is breaking down all of those words that get used all of the time and then really making it personalizing it so that the our young people can really identify okay that's what it feels like to feel respected or to, to know that that person is loyal to me or that trusts me um and 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 that's i mean for me that's the biggest part of prevention the biggest part yeah. is this this healthy question and how do we get there well, yeah and 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 looking at love and what you described as an action their actions it's like i love yes. you but how do we show that how do we demonstrate that as an action yeah oh he loves me but yet you're not treated yeah. very nicely so yeah. it's like i would get to like break it little, down love little actions over time that match those you know so and then and then i say okay let's break that down even further what are all of the little ways and little actions that match this person's words and then maybe what are some actions and words that don't match right and so sometimes it's just the breaking yeah. down of that that really helps a young person you know be yeah. curious about hmm is this is this something that feels good is this something that that is healthy for me so important and in your curriculum you describe having this um really important curriculum that you're trying to get out broadly does that is that one of the components can you talk a little bit more about what you've included in that curriculum that we can look into yeah so we've worked you know we've been in the schools for a really long time and luckily the legislative piece has caught up so health classes have to cover these topics now. They have to help students identify unhealthy relationships, how to build healthy relationship skills, how to talk about consent, consent, consent. I say that three times because I feel like our kids need more time with that. Um, and so what we do uh, is, is we've looked at all of the new um, educational standards and frameworks that the health classes have to um, include in their curriculum. And then we, we say, what can we do to come alongside 
and support what you're already doing, but doing it in a way that makes sure that you're hitting all of these standards. So the students have, um, it's it's a five day curriculum, which is, is, is just scratching the surface, but in a lot of cases, uh, health classes will take maybe one day or 45 minutes to cover this topic. So we're lucky that our educators in Santa Barbara Unified and um, some of our health teachers in Santa Barbara County are really recognizing that this has has so much to do with physical health and emotional health that they're incorporating more of the curriculum into you know they're folding it into their uh, to their lesson plans and so we have the ability in those five days to cover you know what the new uh, lingo is the new relationship lingo is and how do we define that we have the opportunity to really understand the four forms of dating abuse the cycle of abuse we're, we're able to break down your conflict style and to um, practice strategies how to argue in a healthy way. Uh, we can we get to practice what it, it actually means to get consent, right? I call consent a bunch of small little enthusiastic yeses, right? But so breaking mm -hmm. that down with young people and having them understand, especially this new landscape around hooking up is very different from what I what I experienced when I was in high school. And so really helping um, them to navigate those words and what they mean, and then how to really lean into what I feel deserving of having and healthy. So, you know, we sort of finish the curriculum on, you know, what can I, what do I believe I'm deserving of having? And I think that that gives them a good foundation um, to hopefully be to continue to be curious about this important this very very important thing that we're we just don't get much of an opportunity to learn much about which is relationships and it's so important our whole life is is wrapped in our relationships with our loving partners with our parents with our children with our yeah. friends and yeah. we're just not equipped with the relationship skills to be able to navigate that. And when there's conflict or when there's disagreement or misunderstanding, that we're just kind of at a wash. And so what you're addressing is so important in the development of a human being to, to be able to have a life that's meaningful, which is relationship-based. It's everything. Most of our you know, one of the things too, Gina, that I think is really hard for our young people is that this this generation has had so much media consumption and so much access to oh. information than any other generation of any other time in our, you know, in our history. And it's it's really it's 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 what complicates this conversation and what makes it difficult is because from the time they've been little, they've been soaking up all of this media. They've been watching their parents, their friends, their family members, and they and they take all of this information. We call it influencers. All of these different influencers really shape their ideas about what relationships are. And 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 then they're not really given an opportunity to kind of deconstruct all of that and break it down and go, huh, what part of that that I that I just soaked up and took on is healthy? And then what part what parts of those things that I learned would I like to do a little differently? So it's 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 a big part of it is unraveling what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. Um, and so, you know, influencers, I I share with students that I grew up around a lot of domestic violence. I grew up with a dad who hit and um, used words in a very ugly way. And so one of my primary influencers was my dad. And and while I knew that the stuff that was happening in my home was not OK, I never told anybody. I, I finally did when I ran away from home and dropped out of high school. I finally did tell my grandmother, but it was out of desperation because I didn't have anywhere to live. Um, but I but it became my normal and it became my familiar. And so when I was 15 and I started dating, I found myself just kind of naturally being drawn to people who were really jealous and really possessive and didn't really treat me with much respect or kindness and cheated on me. And, and I also thought that that was what it meant to really like somebody because my dad was really jealous and really possessive and, you know, and he cheated. And so there was this part of me who kind of felt like, well, that's what you do if you really like somebody. Um, but I don't think kids have to have grown up around that to be confused about relationship stuff, especially because of the media consumption. 
everything that they've watched from the time they were young has sort of molded their their idea about relationship in ways that are very very unhealthy and it and it just takes time to unravel that and to be curious about it yeah. you, know, I was, you you answered the next question i had which is i read about your history and i read about you know your early influence in, with your father and and how that you you went off on your own, you ran away, you were on the street. So you have firsthand experience of what these young people are experiencing, you know, are going through now or maybe going through. And I think that makes gives it such weight and value that you've had to, you've created your life. You you learned and unlearned. And I'm still learning now. You know, I I'm I think that's You're something stopped. too that I want young people to know is that, you know, learning how to have a healthy relationship, it's a lifelong pursuit. It's something that you have to lean into and make space for every single day, especially if you've grown up around some nonsense. And, and you know, the, the thing is too that I tell the students is that I loved my dad. My dad was also the person who taught me um, how to ski down black diamond moguls and throw a football. And, um, you know, my dad was, he had a side to him that was very loving. So it was confusing growing up around that because it was like, he was, he had his moments where he was very loving and he was very affectionate and, you know, he loved us. And then he had his moments where he was a monster and, and terrifying and scary and violent. And um, so it was both. So being able to to untangle that and then decide, okay, so what, what are those pieces that were positive that I got from my dad that I'd like to take with me? And then what are the things that I absolutely do not want to pass along to the next generation? Because this is how this happens is that everybody gets, you know, I, I say it's like this, this, this basket that you're carrying over your shoulder. Everybody comes into relationships with all of this other stuff, generations of stuff behind them. And until we can slow down and take a minute and take a deep breath and go okay what's in that basket right do i do i want to keep dragging this along with me and there might be some really good things in there that i want to take with me but there might be a lot of stuff in there that you're like nope i don't want to take this with me oh, that's so important you're unpacking i mean literally you know, unpacking all that that you've been that you're you are carrying around yeah. And we have to examine all these things. Yeah. And be curious. And be curious. That's what I always I say what when I walk into a health class. Come from. Yeah. I, I say to young people that health, you know, relationships are going to be one of the most important things in our lives, right? It's why we're still on the planet. We need each other. We need people to get through all of the hard times and then to celebrate the good times. But to, to lean into this and to be curious about this is what is is how we start being unpacking all of this stuff. And it doesn't happen overnight, right? It, it happens slowly over time. No. No, absolutely. And and when you reflect on your life and where you are now, Christy, and all of everything that went into where you are now, can you identify some of those turning points or realizations or light bulbs that you had that turned your life around? Yeah. So now being where you are and yeah, teacher you know, and a parent. it's a, it's a good question because I, you know, I think it's, it's easy sometimes to fall into why, why, you know, it's not fair and why is this happening to me? Or, you know, I, um, my my childhood was had like some good points to it and also some really scary points and i think when i was 16 and i um ran away and dropped out of high school um i a couple of moments where i just felt like really seen was when my grandmother said you know she listened to everything that was like for the first time i told what was happening in my home and she just put her arms around me and she said i love you and i'm sorry this happened and I'm going to keep you safe and I'm going to help you get back on track. So I would say that, you know, look for the helpers, look for the people that will come alongside and see you mm -hmm. and listen to you and believe you and, um, and, and, and help you. 
So that for me was a turning point. Um, and then I remember sitting at, in a, a communications class at City College. It took me a long time to get my high school proficiency. <laughs> I, I tell people I was on the 10 year plan, um, but I started at City College and I was sitting in this communications class and we were, they were talking about how to have a healthy argument. And they were talking about how complicated communication is and you know that you actually have to really you know make sure that you don't have distractions and that you're you know you know how you feel and you know how you can say it in a way that the other person can hear you and tears were just streaming down my face and the teacher came up to me and put her hand on my shoulder and she said are you okay and i said why aren't we teaching this to our young people like this class would have made such a big difference in my life had I'd had some of these skills or had this information. And so for me, that was a big aha moment. It was, it was that where I was like, okay, well, somebody should be teaching this to our young people and sooner and sooner and sooner. It was before social emotional strengths was a thing. It was before we were talking a lot about the importance of emotional, you know, intelligence. Um, this is 30 years ago. And you know, and so now here I am all this time later, and I've just worked. I, that has been my foundation of figuring out how do we get this into, how do we incorporate this into our learning? How do we make sure every young person yeah, gets an opportunity to have this information? Yeah, that was my next question to you is, number one, how can we support you in the work that you're doing? And secondly, Great. what can we do if we see that, you know, with our friends or even we're afraid that we're in an abusive relationship? What can we do? You know, what can you tell your friend or what can you do? And then how can we support you? Great. So I think I get this question asked a lot, especially uh, from high schoolers. Like, I'm worried about a friend. I don't know what to say. And the thing that you need to say, first of all, is that there's nothing, there's no wrong thing that you can do. The first thing is to just say, hey, are you okay? Like, I'm worried about you. And try to be specific. Like, maybe you've, you, they, you don't get to, you, you don't hardly get to see them anymore. Or maybe you're noticing that they're really struggling with their grades or they're not hanging out with their family or friends anymore. So, you know, hey, are you okay? I'm worried about you. Be specific and then listen. Just listen to what's going on for them and try not to make a decision for them or tell them, hey, you should break up or, you know, those are going to be things that will where they will they will shy away from coming to you. So it's really the best thing to do is that I'm worried about you. I care about you. And if it starts to get something where it starts to get dangerous, that's the time to think about who's my trusted adult. Right. So that's the other thing I like to tell young young folks is that. Sometimes there's going to be situations that are totally like over your head and you feel overwhelmed and you're like, I don't know what to do. And that's OK. That's when you know, OK, who's my trusted adult? Who's the person that I can go to that's not going to make it drama and make it bigger and worse, but it's going to come alongside and say, OK, I'm going to help you get through this. We're going to figure this out together. Um, and I would say too, for for I also have young people that once they go through the curriculum, they they start really understanding unhealthy, and they're like, "Wow, I'm doing some of this stuff." So I would say that there's room to be curious and to grow and to learn if you're realizing, "Wow, I'm doing some of this stuff, and I don't, I don't, I want to do it differently," right? And so that's another opportunity to say, "Hey, I I'd like to learn how to do this differently. I want to I want to treat." people in a different way than what I'm doing. So I think it's both. Um, and then I would say for adults is we need to be more curious about this conversation. We need to learn the warning signs. We need to learn the lingo that these that are, this generation is using. And then we need to let our principals know this is important. This needs to be a priority. This needs to be funded. Um, you know, that's what makes this work so challenging sometimes. Like I said, it's the least talked about and it's the least funded. So it makes it difficult to really get curriculum in and, and get resources into our community because um, of lack of funding. But it's going to take all of us having a strong voice. So letting your legislators, letting them know, hey, this is this is something that should be a priority in our community. And what are you doing to fund it? 
um, calling your principal, calling your superintendent, um, finding organizations that are doing this work, because there's a lot of great organizations in our community that are doing this work. Calm is one, Family Service Agency, um, STETSA, Domestic Violence Solutions. So find an organization that you can say, yes, I want to support. You can donate time. You can donate resources. You can you can donate money. Um, you can you can be a strong voice for that organization by by just getting to know them a little bit better. Um, so I think those are a bunch of different suggestions, you know, and then one simple thing is to follow us on social media. So we're at what is love teens on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Start using the hashtag teach love. So it could be as simple as um, I'm starting to bring awareness to this topic by using this hashtag and sharing some of the awareness materials that we're doing on our social media. We also just um, are going to be launching this shop um, that has a bunch of what is love and teach love swag. And that's another great way to start conversations with people and to bring awareness to this issue is by literally just, you know, putting on a hat. I can't tell you how many people I have a teach love hat that I wear when I'm on my walks and I get stopped all the time and it's a great conversation starter. So lots of levels and ways to get, get to get involved. But I think the most important is we've got to just have this conversation regularly. This isn't just a one-time conversation or, hey, I had four or five days in health class conversation. It's a let's start having these conversations more regularly about why this is so vital and important for our young people. Oh, thank you, Christine. I think you've covered, you know, the ground that I wanted to at least tap my, you know, my tap my toe in and learn more it's very i mean it's amazing when you think about the fact that love you know when we think about love and how much we all want love and how little we know or in our own like how we learned the definition of love and how we don't understand the actions that go into it like all of that it's such an important conversation for us to have with our young people yes I mean, so important and educate open it up talk yeah. you know like you know, when you said are you okay that's the yeah just just saying yeah. just literally i say to i say to people you could literally just stand next to them shoulder to shoulder and lean in a little bit right it doesn't even have to be like a verbal thing it could just be like i'm standing next to you i got you i'm here for you you know and that's the that's the way to open it up i love you it's not your fault i'm concerned I'm worried. I care about you. That's the great. That's the best way to start that conversation with somebody you love and you care about. Thank you, Christy. I don't know if you have any closing comments or that seemed like a pretty powerful thing, but if there's anything else you want to say before we close. Um, well, I would say if anybody has any questions, please um, email me at Christy, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y at whatislovedteens.org. Um, if you wanna get connected to resources, you wanna find out more about our curriculum, you wanna find out more about our advocacy with our legislators, um, just reach out and um, I'll do everything I can to get you connected. And I just so appreciate you, Gina, yeah, for you having me on and, and helping you know bring our message to a, you know, a, a, trying to reach as many people as we can. And it takes all of us working together to do that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine. And you have yourself a really nice evening. And thank you for all your work and your passion and dedication and love for this. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.